All right. Well, hey, good morning, Rise City Church. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, um, so next week, I'm going to kick off a new series called Same Old Tricks, looking at just the temptation that Jesus experienced in the wilderness and how our enemy, Satan, really is just a one-trick pony, same old tricks. Same things Jesus was tempted with in the wilderness, we are bombarded with that temptation today. So we're going to jump into that next week. But in between then and now, I wanted to land today in a particular letter uh, in the Bible that I really hadn't spent much time reading or thinking about, and I'm willing to bet that'd probably be true for a lot of people in this room. And as we'll see in just a moment, this letter has some stuff in there at times. It's like, oh, wow, that's, that's kind of, that seems just out there a little bit. Um, but a couple weeks ago, I was uh, in the morning reading my Bible, and I was in this, this rut. I don't know if you can resonate with this, but at times... There are moments you read the Bible and you're like, oh, yes, like I feel like it's speaking right to me. And I just, I feel like God's just gripping my heart through it. And there's other times you read it and you're like, yeah, that's cool. Like, I know that. I've read that. Like, that's good. But it just, it doesn't like, like somehow stick. And, and I've been kind of in this rut. And that particular morning, I was just praying. I said, God, would you, I kind of feel like I've been reading for a little bit and just nothing's like really like, ah. And I was like, I wrote that, ah, you know, and. And so uh, I found this particular letter, this book of the Bible, and uh, I don't want to over-spiritualize it. I, I picked it because it's the shortest book in the whole Bible. And I was like, well, at least I, I can say I, I read a whole book of the Bible today. You know, it's one chapter. And so I landed on these 25 verses, and sure enough, it was that gripping experience where I was like, oh my goodness, like, how have I not paid attention to this book, or how have I not read this? And how, I mean, and as I read it, it just, it felt like it was written for people in the 21st century. I felt like it was written for me, but it was like, man, how are churches and pastors not like heeding the words of these words that were written 2,000 years ago, but they are speaking so powerfully and pertinent still to us today. And so I shared it with our staff. I was like, man, I'm just, I'm just gonna talk about it uh, on a Sunday morning and, uh, and really dig into it. Uh, it's a letter that was written actually about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And at that time, the, the initial Christians are becoming a little bit more disillusioned in the faith because, I mean, here's the deal. Many of them had lived and seen Jesus, saw him crucified, raised from the dead, and he said he's coming back, except now it's 30 years later, and they're probably thinking, you, you said you're coming back? I thought you meant like Tuesday. It's not like, two, this, lots of Tuesdays have passed in 30 years. And, and, and what's happened is there's also kind of this kind of cultural tide that swept into the church more and, and the Christians are beginning to drift away, if you will, from their fervency and devotion to their faith. And I don't know about you, but I, I, have, I have felt that drift in my own heart. I feel like I, I see and sense that drift, just even in, I want to speak specifically to the Western or American church, that in the last couple of years, it just feels like that the, the power and the potency, and the fervency and the, God, that, that grip factor for a lot of people who say they're followers of Christ, has began, began to, to drift or wane a little bit. And, and instead, there's this kind of more rising tide of ambivalence. And like, eh, you know, I mean, it's, it's okay. Like, yeah, Jesus is my homeboy. He's cool. I still love him. But I don't, I don't know what bearing it has in my life. And, and, and there's a rise of deconstructionism. And is this even true? And can we believe this? And all that kind of stuff. And less people go to church now and all that kind of stuff. And, and it just feels like this, like, this drift. And so this drift that was being experienced in some way 2,000 years ago is in many ways replicating itself just in, in different mediums, you know, here in the 21st century. And as I read this letter, I was like, man, this is so good. And so I just want to spend our time this morning reading through the letter of Jude. How many of you have spent a lot of time reading Jude lately? You're like, where's that at? Well, it's right before uh, the book of Revelation. And it was written, here's the thing about Jude that a lot of people don't realize. Jude is actually a brother of Jesus, like an earthly brother of Jesus. Mark chapter 6, verse 3 talks about the siblings that Jesus had. And many people are familiar that James, who wrote the epistle, James is one of his brothers. But a lot of people forget about Jude, which you shouldn't forget about Jude. Because can you imagine what would it take for you to actually come to believe that your brother was God? Right? I mean, that, that would, that's pretty significant faith to be like, oh, yeah, my brother Jesus. Yeah, he's the Messiah. <laughs> But at some point, Jude comes to this convincing faith and dedication that his brother is not just his brother, his brother is his Savior and his Lord. And he writes these 25 verses to Christians who are beginning to drift and to say, what does it look like to not completely 
drift away. And so I want to I read through, just, and, and this is going to be pretty raw. Like, what comes to mind is going to be like, what I, bleh, like, so, and there's things in this that are going to be encouraging. There's going to be things that are going to be convicting. There's going to be things you'll be like, I don't agree with Jude, and I don't agree with Brandon. Okay. But I felt like it was necessary. Just, let's, let's just get in God's word this morning, and let's see what this, uh, this letter has to say to us. Um, I want to start, before I jump fully into Jude, I want to start with a, a story, actually, though, that that I found in a, in a book that I read a long time ago called The Fear of God by an author and pastor by the name of John Bevere. And in this book, he tells of this incident in, in the early 1990s when he went to go visit a particular person in prison. And the person he went to go visit in prison was a man by the name of Jim Baker. Some of you know that name. Jim Baker and Tammy Faye in the uh, 80s were like at the height of religious programming and I mean, equivalent to kind of like the exposure of Joel Osteen today and, 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 and having this huge effective like television ministry and all this stuff. But 1989, a lot of that came crashing down because first off, Jim Baker had an affair and second, he was indicted on federal charges of fraud and embezzlement by, by taking money that he received from this you know, very lucrative religious programming and padding his pockets with it. And so he was sentenced actually to 64 years in prison. Now, the, the sentence was reduced to eight. I mean, I don't know how that all works all the time. Like, 64, actually eight. But, but within eight years, he's in jail. And John Bevere goes to visit Jim Baker. Because he's, I think he saw Jim Baker as someone that really looked like he was on fire for the Lord, but how did he all of a sudden have an affair and have these fraudulent actions? And so in this book, he, he recounts this meeting that he had with Jim Baker in prison. I just want to read this excerpt from this book. And this is what he says. Because I think what, what we hear Jim Baker say is really kind of the synop synopsis of what we're going to hear Jude say today. He says, after he had talked for a while, referring to Jim Baker, he said, I felt like, and I being John Bevere, said, I felt like I wanted to ask him some more questions. He said, the first question I asked him was, Jim, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? When did you stop loving Jesus? Was it when you committed adultery with Jessica Hahn seven years before you got thrown into prison? Was it the fraud? When did it really happen? Because he said, I remember that he was so on fire for God in his early years. He says, then Jim looked at me and he said, John, I, I, I didn't. And I said, what do you mean you didn't? He said, I didn't fall out of love with Jesus. I loved him all the way through it. And then he saw the total bewilderment on my face. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, John, I loved Jesus, but I stopped fearing God. I always loved Jesus, yet he was no longer my Lord, and there are millions of Americans just like me. L let, me let me read that last line again, because it's perhaps an indictment for many of us. John, I loved Jesus, but I stopped fearing God. I always loved Jesus, yet he was no longer my Lord, and there are millions of Americans just like me me. And that, I love Jesus, but I don't necessarily fear God thing, strikes a chord with me. And is it not perhaps a sentiment that might help explain why a lot of Christians today feel disillusioned? Because we still have the warm, fuzzy, Jesus is my boyfriend and all that kind of stuff. But the reverence, fear, honor, and obedience side is like, eh. Is that perhaps why that there are people who do not yet call themselves Christians have skepticism towards Christians because they see like, oh, they got all these like, you know, moments that they, they say they love Jesus, but their lives really don't look anything different. So there's not this like fear, reverence, awe, honor, peace to it. He says, John, I, I always loved Jesus. I just stopped fearing God. My confession is I feel like I have drifted in that direction. And Jude says, hey, Brandon. And Jude says, hey, anybody. I got something that God told me to write down that you might want to read. So let me just start digging in. All right, so if you can turn the book of Jude, it's right for the book of Revelation. It's, it's 25 verses. So it's easy to miss it. Table of contents are completely permissible. So find the page number, go to it, or I'll be here on the screen. I want to read it, stop, add thoughts, 
Keep going, and then we will call out our time today. It says, this letter, pick it up in verse one, this letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. This is a big deal to label, label yourself a slave to your brother. <laughs> Didn't say, hey, I'm the brother of Jesus. He says, no, I'm a bond servant. I'm a slave. This, this Jesus is more than just my brother. He is my savior, my Lord. That's who's writing it. He says, I'm also the brother of James. He says, I am writing to all of those who have been called by God the Father who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ, may God give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. He says, I am writing. My intended audience for this letter are those of you who have received and are kept in the grace and the love of God. He's writing to followers of Jesus, and he's saying, I want you to know that God loves you. God cares deeply for you. And may you be a person marked with an abundance, a multiplication of mercy, peace, and love in your life. What would the world look like today, Rise City Church, if followers of Jesus were marked by a multiplication and abundance of mercy, peace, and love? What would that look like? He says, that's who I'm writing to. Now let me tell you some things of what I want to write to you about. He says, dear friends, in verse 3, I had been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find I must write about something else urging you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I think that that's the part that originally stuck out to me when I was reading a couple weeks ago. Because I was like, oh my goodness, like, first off, this is, in my opinion, shows like the writers of the Bible had at times an agenda, but other times they were surrendered to the, the move of the Spirit. And he said, I was originally wanting to just write you a letter about how we got this common salvation, how Jesus has saved us and how we, he's, he's forgiven us. And just, I want to talk to you about that. But then something was like deep in my crawl. Something was buried in my gut. I just, I had this urge, this compelling notion that I got to change direction on you. And I don't know about you, and I never want to abuse this tactic, because I think if it's ever used for this reason, it's wrong, but have you ever been around a, a preacher, a teacher, and they come up on stage, and you're like, I was going to talk to you about this, but I felt God tell me to talk to you about this, and you're like, really? And you lean in, because you're like, well, this is like not pre-planned, like this is something else, so maybe this is a fresh word from God. Well, Jude got me. And I was like, oh, tell me more. Like, you, you want to talk about this and write about this, but now what are you wanting to talk about and write about to us today? And he says that I had this urge to encourage you to defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time. Because he says this, because I say this, picking up verse four, I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches. Some translations say they slipped in the side door. This was a little bit more graphic. They you know, worm their way in into your churches. And they're saying this. They are saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jude is deterred from writing about the salvation for all. and says, now I've got to write to you about this. There are these people. And, and these people would even label themselves as followers of Jesus. But they've kind of slithered in, or they've come to the side door. Maybe you weren't even aware of it. And their influence is beginning to take influence at the larger scale. And, and the detriment that they're bringing into the church is this notion that God's grace is absolutely marvelous. And because of that, it gives you license and permission to live immoral lives. They are advocating directly or indirectly abusing God's grace for your own personal gain. Or as Jim Baker would say, to love Jesus, but don't necessarily have to fear God. Love Jesus and like, I love me some grace. But the whole idea of like honor, reverence, obedience, eh, that doesn't feel as fun. And he says they've wormed their way in. And it's causing an issue. And, and what's happened here is they have began different ways of saying the same thing. They have said yes to Jesus being their savior, the forgiver of your sins, but they have not bowed a knee in allegiance to Jesus as the Lord of their lives. 
They've wanted the, the benefit and the gain of feeling like all my sins are pardoned and expunged from my record, but now I'm free to live however the heck I want. Because he'll just forgive me anyway, because that's who he is. It's not a big deal. Or if it was, you know, it's fine. He'll just, you know, it's, it's like a kid that has a, a parent that just puts no boundaries and is like, you do whatever you want. It's all good. I still love you. I don't agree with that form of parenting, just so you know that. Sorry, you might have picked that up. And he says, this is, this is a problem. This is a problem. And, and here's what's happened. And I think the church, and I label myself as a part of the church, one, because the church is people. So if you're a Christian, you're part of the church. Two, the organization we call the church, we haven't done a good job in different decades. We've, we've went with pendulum swings as opposed to putting tension and balance between two things. So what I mean by that is, for a period of time, the pendulum was so swung to this element of like truth, allegiance, lordship, obedience. You got to follow God, be holy. And, and so it's the Lord side. And what that resulted in, because at times the grace of Jesus was talked about, what it wasn't emphasized. And so what that happens is that when, when truth is emphasized without also grace coupled with it, what actually produces is self-righteousness, judgmentalism, and condemnation to those who aren't living as holy as you are. And that became the reputation for the church, I would say, in the late 70s and early 80s. Bunch of hypocrites, bunch of judgmental people, all this other kind of stuff. And so then the pendulum then swung in the, in the early 90s, early 2000s, and then churches began doing what's called seeker sensitivity and, and welcoming more people. And what happened was, is the message got shifted to just grace at the expense of truth. Jesus is your savior. Jesus loves you. He's all for you. You're awesome in his eyes. You're made in his image, which is all true. But we didn't talk about, and he demands your whole life. And so when you have just the emphasis of savior, grace, without truth and lordship, then you have people who are living lives that look just like everyone else because they feel like their pardon is a license to live however you want, and they have failed to see, oh yeah, but God actually has a way that he's called us to live, and he's serious about it. And Jesus, when he came, the scriptures say in the book of John, he was the full embodiment of grace and truth. And so you got to have an adequate dose of both in your life to recognize the fullness and the robust aspect of what true love is found in Jesus. And so the pendulum has swung way far this way. And, and the evidence of that, I would say, is there's, a less, there's less display of God's power and transformation in the lives of people because Christians today really look very, very, there's very little difference of distinction between Christians and non-Christians. You can see divorce rates, debt ratios, giving records, consumptive habits, addictions, mental health, they all are on par and equal. It's like, so what, what, what's, what makes the difference then? And when you start seeing that there's not very much difference, you start to become disillusioned and disenfranchised and discouraged. And I think Jude's saying, under the power of the Holy Spirit, it's like, well, because we're overemphasizing one thing at the expense of another, and we need to like, not just swing the pendulum one way or another, we gotta come back here to the middle. Anybody resonating with this yet? Okay, good, you're silenced. I didn't know how to interpret it, thank you. I just wanna make sure. So then Jude's like, so let me just, let me remind you some things. <laughs> I mean, this is like, you know, I don't know what kind of brother Jude was to Jesus. He definitely seemed like the older brother. The, we even went to the prodigal story. He's probably the older brother and like, you know, who knows who, maybe James was the older brother and then Jesus was the younger brother. I don't know how that works out, but he, he seems like he's pretty, he's pretty like, let me just get in your face on this one. He says this, picking up in verse uh, five, he says, can I just remind you? So I think he's reminding them, he's reminding us, if we think that God's marvelous grace is a license you live in moral lives, let me just remind you this. So I want to remind you something that you already know these things, but that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but he later destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And it reminds you of angels who did not stay within the limits of authority of God that God gave them, but they left the place where they belonged, and God has now kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. Now, this is one of those verses you're like, say, what? <laughs> like, so just to understand, Jude references things that we call from our Old Testament, but he also references some other books that didn't make kind of like the, the completed Bible, like First Enoch, the Testament of Moses, 
But, but Jews in that time studied an abundance of different literature. And so he's giving references to things that they would realize. And one of the books, First Enoch, references this time of, of angels kind of like doing their own thing and then being locked away. And then, then he gives a third example in verse 7. He says, and don't forget Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. Those cities were destroyed by fire and they serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. Um, that seems pretty harsh. Anybody triggered by that? Three examples that he gives. He's like, here's the deal. Like, there's, there's both. Like, when the Israelites were rescued and God's grace was prominent, and then they went and just like started to complain and live however they wanted, there was there was rebellion, and God said, I'm not deal, I'm not having that, and there was punishment that came. Talks about angels that decided they were they were in the presence of God, serving God, they were in the fullness of God, and yet they turned from God, and God's like, there's a problem with that. And then he references from Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that whether it was because of a lack of hospitality by the people there or because of the illicit acts of sexual morality and even homosexuality, that God eventually took down that city because they chose to say, I don't think God is, is a God to be feared. Essentially, we'll do whatever we want. So Jews like, don't forget, like a part of God's resume, yes, he's unbelievably loving, patient, and kind, but he but he's also God. And this notion of to have fear for him is this aspect of to have reverence for him, to have honor towards him, to realize that he's an authority. And that if he is truly Lord, then like, and he is in all and creates all, can be all, knows all, like, I am nothing compared to that. So there's a little bit of like some trepidation that I want to walk with when I come to him. So he said, let me remind you of these things. And he gives these three examples. And after he gives these three examples, then he says, okay, so that's part of the historical record, but let me just talk about you right now. Verse eight, he says, in the same way, these people, and these people, he's talking about those people who use God's grace as a license to live however they want, who's wormed their way in or slipped through the side door, these same people who claim to have authority from their dreams, they live immoral lives, they defy authority, and they scoff at supernatural beings. It says, but even Michael, one of the mightiest of angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. This took place when Michael was, at, uh, was, was arguing with the devil about the body of Moses. Another thing was like, say, how did he know that? He's referencing the Testament of Moses. It's a different book. But, but when he's trying to say it, he's like, here's examples of how they are living their lives outside of, of the grace of God and the boundaries of God to, to both love God and fear God. He says three things. One, they live immoral lives. Some translations, a better translation might be they, they, they pollute their own bodies. A second thing he says is they defy authority. And then he says they also, they scoff at supernatural beings. Some translations say they heap abuse on celestial beings. I would contend with us this morning that these same three things that are to be evidences of people choosing not to give themselves both to the saviorship and the lordship of Jesus, the fruit of that, or the bad fruit of that, are these same three things today. Living lives where we pollute our own bodies, living immoral lives, number one. That, that most commentators and theologians, based on language, see that as being like really tied to sexual immorality and deviance. But to pollute your own bodies, to, to consider how in our world today that we are a rampant sexual culture without boundaries. And we actually encourage it, even though we see it wrecks people's lives. A polluting of bodies where, where men should have a higher honor for women, but yet they continue to like pursue women that look provocative or they go online and consume things that just only reinforce for the woman that her body is what actually matters most about her. Or just take a quick scroll through TikTok and see the videos. You tell me that women don't pollute their own bodies to get attention on TikTok? Sorry, TikTokers out there. Your pastor's not a fan. The way we pollute our own bodies based upon what we consume, what we eat, what we drink, what we wear. I mean, like, that's, that's just... I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying, let's take a step back and just take inventory and say, yeah, yeah, like there's, in terms of what the scriptures say, there's a lot of living immoral lives going on. 
The sacredness of marriage and the protection of sex within that is shunned and laughed at by most. Defy authority. That is the time we live in. All authority is now questioned and considered suspect. Whether it be church authority, whether it be governmental authority, whether it be um, first responders authority, whether it be teachers, whether it be Wall Street, like anything that has a position of authority, people are trying to take that down. Because who are you to tell me what to do? Because I'm me. I'm me. Do you not know I got my own podcast? I got my own Instagram account? I got my own algorithm and Amazon knows exactly what I want? Who are you to tell me what I need to do? Or this idea of that they scoff at supernatural beings or that they heap abuse on celestial beings. We live in a time where anything that's labeled of potentially being of God, origin God, miraculous movement of God is seen only through natural means and scientific explanation. Now, I'm not trying to pit those two against each other. I believe that science actually gives explanation to what God instituted. But we scoff at anything supernatural or transformational or Anything that God might do in a healing manner, we're kind of like, eh, whatever. We, and we just, we just kind of like excuse that. And he says, this is what happens when you just, you don't see God in the fullness of who he is. The embodiment of both grace and truth. And I can't help but just constantly going back to, and Jude lived with and grew up with Jesus. So these are probably some things he heard his brother say. He goes on. Hey, I I promise you, Jude gets nice here in a minute. It's okay, so hang in there. He goes on. He says, but these people scoff at things. This is verse uh, 10. These people scoff at things they do not understand. Like unthinking animals, they do whatever their instincts tell them, and so they bring about their own destruction. What a great description of humanity today. I mean, we really do. We look more like animals than humans now because we, we only go by our urges, instincts, and appetites, which that's what animals do, versus live under the unction of the Spirit of God and find life and direction in that way. Animal instincts. It says, what sorrow awaits them, for they follow in the footsteps of Cain who killed his brother. So he's like, let me give you some more examples. You follow this way and it's only about you and do your thing. Remember Cain? Cain ended up being consumed with jealousy, bitterness, at this point he ended up killing his own brother. Do we not see anger and rage today in society? He said, or let me give you an example, like Balaam, they deceive people for money. Balaam chose to pursue the, the, the enticing lures of, of King Gate Balak, and he said, I'll give you riches if you would turn your back on, on God's people. And people now will do anything out of greed and consumption and acquisition. And then he goes on the last one, he said, don't forget also Korah, they perished in rebellion. They decided to shake their fist at people that God had placed in positions of authority. And God took offense to that because ultimately it wasn't the people they were offending because they were offending God because God said, this is what I've chosen. And so before we just completely land blast certain people and cancel them, perhaps we should ask, Is it possible that God maybe somehow used him for a purpose? Verse 12. When these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love. So he's talking about when they, now when you you share a meal in that time, they would share a meal and they'd have communion as a part of their, their meal. So they would break bread, remembering Christ's body broken. They would drink from a cup of wine, remember Christ's blood being shed for the forgiveness of sins and the ushering of a new covenant. He says, when they take that meal, here's, let me give you some visual imagery, some metaphors to this. Because they are, in this moment, they are celebrating their forgiveness through communion in the Lord's Supper. And so, right, they are, loving Jesus, but, but they're not living lives that show lordship to him. And he says, and this is, this is just some pictures, like this is what they are. He goes, they're like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They're like shameless shepherds who care, care only for themselves. They're like clouds blowing over the lands without giving any rain. They're like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and they can be pulled up by their roots. They're like wild waves of the sea, churning up the foam of their, sh- of their shameful deeds. They're like wandering stars doomed forever to the blackest darkness. He's essentially saying, listen, they look good on the surface, but behind it, 
the way they tell you to live will not end in your thriving. It will end in your destruction. And here's, here's maybe what I just, I, I, does anybody else have their heart broken right now when you see the state of the world? Anybody else tired of just turning on the news? Which you probably shouldn't even turn on the news because it's going to make you angry because that's what they do. That's how they, that's how they make the money. Make you angry, you click more. So stop. We, we're the ones that need to stop just clicking. But anybody else is tired of being like, gosh, everybody's psycho. Gosh, everybody's lost their flipping minds. What's up? What's down? Like, I mean, anybody else tired of that? And yet we, we see the things being advocated and we see the fruit of that. And he's saying, it's just like these things. It's like, Dead trees and shipwrecks. And stuff. It's not working. It's not working. And I, and I know, I fear right now, I hear some of you think that I, I just become a cantankerous old dad. I'm the old guy now, and I should just go and put my loafers on and some plaid socks and go mow a lawn. I get it. I get it. Me and John Cumby, let's do that. Oh, come on. You got that? Let's go. And, come on. But be honest. Is it working? Does it look like we're thriving? I want to skip ahead down to verse 16. He says, these people, because it was going to come to a conclusion, just he says, these people are grumblers and complainers, living only to satisfy their desires. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. This just seems like the definition of social media. I mean, that seems like, what's, give me a descriptive statement of Twitter. Boom. Grumblers, complainers, living only to satisfy their own desires, bragging loudly about themselves, and they flatter others to get what they want. Okay, cool. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, be real. I'm cool now. I know that one now. Be real. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know about it either. What's, what's be real? I, yeah, ask Anthony. He knows. He's, he's faster. Um, <laughs> told you, I'm just kind of like, <laughs> um, but right, like, maybe not social media. Maybe you. Maybe me, grumblers and complainers. Get off my lawn. That's all of us. All those are Karens, whatever. Use your description. Like, it's just like. And, and Jude's like, stop. What are you doing, followers of Jesus? What, what are we doing? In Pete's language last week, why are we advocating raw at the expense of Tove? And so Jude comes to this like place at the end and he says, Can I just, I just want to remember, I want to write you essentially for one reason, but I'm going to write you to, to be aware of this, but ultimately now to help you contend and defend your faith and not to drift away. Verse 17. But you, my dear friends, I love that he says dear friends, because I, I think if I'm one of the original readers, I'm like, man, Jude doesn't like me. But he says, no, no, because I like you, because I love you, I'm going to tell you the truth, but I'm also going to give you some practical ways to experience God's grace. He says, but you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you in the last times that there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their own, they follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. Five things here. This is the first of five things that he says, like how to contend the faith and begin to like not drift away. The first thing he says is first off, you gotta remember that this was promised. Jude's like, this isn't something new. And if Jude said that 2,000 years ago, I'm telling us today, Rise City Church, this was promised. The world feeling like it's in chaos is not something God's like, oh my gosh, I didn't see that one coming. He's like, I promise you it would be. I promise you things would get worse before they get better. But the better would be actually you shining in the things that are worse. This is promise. So let me say, don't lose heart when you feel like things are going a certain way, this was promised. It actually should bring encouragement because maybe this next Tuesday is when he is coming back because he promised he's returning. This was promised. Don't lose heart in that. 
Losing heart both in like belief, but also losing heart and still accepting his unbelievable, marvelous, rich grace and living in trust of his lordship and leadership in your life. Second thing, he goes on, he says this, verse 20, he says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Build each other up. We have become too individualistic and selfish at the expense of loving those around us. And when a faith is based upon how you love one another, if you do not have a one another to love and you only love yourself, is it any wonder that you begin to wonder if the author of that actual faith is legit or not? Because you're not living it out anyway. A part of us having greater substantiation and dearth and weight and belief to our faith is when we apply it in the lives of not just ourselves and our own benefit, but we exercise it for the benefit of those around us. That we are there to encourage and to lift up. We are there to, to pray and to spur on. We are there to give. We're there to lament and to grieve. We're there to celebrate and to champion. We're there to not just say, when someone has a direction, they want to like, just follow your heart. That's terrible advice. That's terrible advice. Just follow your, no, what does the Lord say about it? Let me encourage you in the ways of God. Let me show you that he's good and pleasing and he has a will for you. Let me build you up so you would prosper. Remember this is promised. Build each other up. He goes into this next thing, which this was so convicting to me. He says, and pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, how weak has my prayer life become because of my digital distraction? Hashtag confessions of your pastor. I spend way more time on something with a screen than I do on my knees before my God. I don't know if I'm alone in that. And a part of my drifting isn't simply because I don't believe, it's because I haven't spent any time. It's the same would happen with my wife. I didn't spend any time with her. Eventually my heart will drift away or vice versa, right? I want to pray for God's power and his spirit to work mightily in the circumstances that, can, that just tie me up and bind me and frustrate me. Like, take it to the Lord. Jude's like, spend time with him. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. He keeps going on, verse 21. Two more of these. He says, so pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus because he will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. We have to continue to await God's mercy. Tied to that thing, this was already promised, but remember that God is bringing mercy. And maybe you do feel downcast. Maybe you do feel depressed. Maybe you do feel discouraged. But God's mercy is there now, and it's coming in greater abundance because he will make good on another promise. He's coming back. He'll make all things new. He'll wipe every tear from every eye. He will be a righteous judge. Don't lose heart. It might be this Tuesday, but await the Lord's mercy. Don't pursue and gravitate towards cheap imitations of something that may feel merciful. Pursue the mercy of Jesus, and last but not least, then he also says, this kind of goes with build each other up. He says, and you also then must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. I love this. Because sometimes when people's faith is wavering, we get frustrated versus having mercy and coming beside them and walking with them, encouraging them. I get this. Let's walk together. I'm not giving up on you. Let's keep going. It's a part of being in each other's life and pursuing God together. Show mercy to one another. But I also would say show mercy to one another without compromise because he goes on and he says, show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Be careful as you are merciful that you do not become permissible to those things that are outside of God's will. And sometimes in our act of mercy, we are becoming more permissible because we don't want to offend. But instead, part of being merciful is being there and lovingly pointing people to the truth. And if we don't, then sometimes we can get swept up in what's not true and find our lives contaminated by the exact same thing that the person who was binded was binded with. 
But in all of these examples, he's telling us to be active, to be engaged, not disengaged and disassociated, but continue living it out, continue pursuing the Lord, continue to build each other up, continue to await his mercy, continue to be there, to have mercy for those who are struggling and not to push them down further, but help be active in lifting them back up. And Jude then concludes simply by just saying this, because here's the deal. Now all glory to God, verse 24, who is able to keep you from falling away. God can do this. Your final story does not have to end with you falling away. Because God gets glory, and he's able to keep you from falling away, and he will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fall. Jim Baker never followed Jesus because he understood this part of it, because he will lavish you with unconditional love and mercy. You will be seen as if you didn't have a single fall, but don't forget also, glory to him who is God alone, Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, authority were all his before time, in the present, and beyond all time. He's Savior and he's Lord. He's Lord and he's in charge, but he's also willing to take the position of a servant to lift you up. He's both and. He's grace, he's truth, he's Savior, he's Lord. Don't pit one against the other. See him through both and you'll experience his love. And be active in your faith so you do not lose heart. I want to close with something that inspired me yesterday and then we'll uh, sing a song or something together. (laughs) So yesterday, uh, there was these big tabletops set up and there were six of us that were as panelists. We were doing the uh, Christmas offering 10 for 10 People are giving their Shark Tank presentations in here. We're going to, God willing, based upon your generosity, we're selecting 10 organizations that we're going to give up to $25,000 a piece to through the Christmas offering. We had 54 nominees. We reduced that down to 21. 21 organizations presented to us yesterday in a Shark Tank format. It was fun, at least for us. We didn't have to present. It was, just, it was not probably fun. It was probably really nerve-wracking. But nonetheless, here, here's, here's what I came away with. We selected the 10, and we'll let you know those 10 soon. It was awesome. I can't wait. Get ready. Get your money ready. It's going to be great. <laughs> but here's the deal. I got through even the first 12 or 15 at lunch break. I just told the team, I said, here's, here's, what's, here's what's gripping my heart right now. In a time when most of what we read and see has a lot of complaint, grumbling, negativity, and all this other kind of stuff, and what's going on in the world, and blah, 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 blah. We just watched 21 presentations of people who said, I'm not going to get stuck in the mud, but I'm going to do something about it. I'm not just going to accept that there's sex trafficked boys and girls, but we're going to do something about it. I'm not just going to just accept that a lot of kids, like their life goes to ruin in the foster care system, but we're going to come beside the foster care system and be beside them. I'm not just going to let a life get terminated in the womb, but we're going to come beside that mom so she didn't feel like she had that decision. I'm not just going to let people not ever hear about Jesus, both here and internationally, but we're going to help pour into pastors and, and make disciples and make disciples and start churches. I mean, there were just so many ways that people said, I'm staying active, I'm still gonna contend, I'm still gonna believe, and I walked away being like, the world isn't near as bad at times as the news makes it. You just gotta look for the good that's out there that sometimes doesn't get the press. And Jude would say, yeah, don't let that stuff warm its way in here. Don't let it slip through the side door. Keep looking for God in all things and you'll find him, but who are you looking for in it? But never get to the place of just loving Jesus, but also failing to, f- failing to actually fear God. It's both and. It's grace and truth. It's Savior and Lord. And he wants us to see, us, see him in that light. Will you stand with me? God, I want to ask in this time that as we sing this song, that, that the song is not so much the song as it is the lyrics, and those lyrics would be our prayer, God, that you would revitalize and recharge our hearts, God. And for some, it's probably maybe unfamiliar as it's a new song, but God, that they just maybe just really focus on the lyrics in the same way that I hoped a couple weeks ago that something would grip me, that that this would grip them. And God, that you would continue to move us faithfully forward and maybe be faithful as we move forward and step with you, God. We need you. We repent. We say sorry. If we have abused your grace to live however we want or if we haven't 
embraced your grace and we find our stock and how holy we are, but we fail to remember, yeah, but we were destined to die without God intervening through Jesus Christ. So we offer this time to you now. Thank you for your timeless word that speaks to us in this moment, even though it was written 2,000 years ago, because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whether it's Tuesday or Tuesdays way past now, we eagerly await you when you make all things as you desired. And we trust you in that. Find us faithful in between now and then. In Jesus' name, amen.